Sir, there's no doubt about it, one of them said. Somebody killed three of those ghouls before we could even get to them. Do you think they were turning on each other for some reason? Another asked. This close to prey? I don't think so, the knight commander replied. Remember, ghouls are like starving wolves. They never attack a member of their own pack when there's mortal flesh around. I think it's more likely that there's a Mari living in this town in secret. Don started to feel a little chill travel up his spine when he heard that word. Humans were hardly reclusive, per se, but they almost never had dealings with the other peoples of Eldrum, and it was especially rare to hear of one of them appearing inside the borders of the human territories. For the most part, humans only heard about the other races of Eldrum from legends and old stories, which were almost certainly outdated, but the stories about the Mari had been some of the creepiest. Though technically still the same species as other human beings, the Mari were said to possess legendary, supernatural powers, which they used to travel rapidly to wherever they wanted to go, and to kill their enemies with cunning, ruthless efficiency. Worst of all, if the stories about them were true, then they almost never revealed their true nature to others, unless they were about to strike. It was chilling to think that a being like that might live among the peaceful people of Troma. Then again, as difficult as it was to accept, it was equally hard to dismiss the idea. Don had been under attack by a vicious ghoul before the knights had even reached the village, and the ghoul had fallen to the ground in pieces, killed by something that Don hadn't seen. That, Don realized, all seemed to point to the same conclusion that the knights had been discussing. One of the citizens of Troma could have been Amari in disguise. Once again, Don knew that he would have felt better if he'd had the ability to defend himself, to fight the threats that appeared instead of having to run and hide all the time. That was the real purpose of his dream, and the news about the Mari was only strengthening Don's motivations. He couldn't live his life in fear. Quickly, Don climbed back down from the roof where he'd watched the battle, trying his best to memorize every single nuance of the fight he'd just witnessed. It had certainly been a very impressive skirmish, but Don knew that there was only so much that he could learn from what he'd seen on that battlefield. If he really wanted to be a knight, Don knew, he needed practical training of some kind, and the moment he thought of that, he started to feel down again. Don had brought up the subject of his ambitions a number of times with the people he knew in town, but the only ones who seemed to take him seriously were his best friends and his father, and Don definitely didn't want to get stuck listening to another of his dad's speeches. Unfortunately, from the looks of things, a speech was exactly what Don was going to get as he headed for home that night. His father was sitting on the porch, waiting impatiently for Don to return, and wearing a sour look on his face. Don could tell immediately that he wasn't going to hear the end of it for a while. Don's father was named Salvatore Brookside. His first name was fairly common, but as with everyone in Troma, his second name was unique. No one else had the same second name as him, not even the members of his own family. That, after all, was the purpose of second names, to distinguish people from one another. As soon as Don set one foot on the porch of his home, his father spoke, sounding like he was trying to suppress a lot of anger. Do you mind explaining where you were today? Don knew that there was no explanation he could have come up with that would have satisfied his father, so he just replied, I can't. No dinner tonight. Sal replied angrily, drawing a glare of fury from his son. Don had been pretty active for most of the day, and he was almost starving. I know you're upset, but I can't think of any other way to get it through your head, Sal said, looking away from his son so that he didn't need to look him in the eyes as he spoke. Childhood is a time of mistakes for everyone, but you need to learn from those mistakes and become a better person. Otherwise, they might as well not have happened. You don't seem to be learning anything, and I can understand why. A violent way of life is foolish and short-sighted, Sal continued as he got to his feet looking at his son again. It robs you of the joys of peaceful living, hardens you to the suffering of others, and in the end, every person who chooses that lifestyle winds up being killed by someone, whether in their prime or when they start to get old and weak. People who live in peace live longer lives. Violence just hurts everyone it touches. Don had heard the speech a million times before, and he knew that no arguments that he put forth would be considered by his father. In fact, they'd only served to drag the speech out, which he definitely didn't want. For the time being, therefore, Don kept his mouth shut, but he knew what the truth of the matter was. The lessons that Sal had been taught by his wife's death had been different from the ones that Don had learned. Sal had seen that Serenity had been cut down by the enemy, and it had made him the most steadfast kind of pacifist in the world. Don had heard about his mother's death in battle, and it had taught him the lesson that a person had to be prepared if they wanted to defend the people they cared about. There was no pacifism in Don DeLay's philosophy on life. When Don's father had talked about Serenity's death in the past, he seemed to have continually spun the tale into what he wanted it to be, describing it as a simple matter of his wife walking out into a battlefield and getting killed. But Don had heard other versions of the story from his teachers, and even some of the other people around town. Don's mother had been, according to them, a very devoted town guard who had been struggling to hold off a group of monsters, probably not too different from the ones that had attacked Troma that very day. She had been killed by one of them, but she would taken five with her before she died, and saved a whole family from being killed in the street. Don had eventually chosen to believe that story, and not just because it gave his mother's death a much greater meaning in his eyes. 
When he thought about his mother in that kind of light, as a heroic person who'd made the choice to sacrifice herself for the people of her town, Don saw bigger truths about his own life, and about life in general. The fact was that someone had to take that risk. Someone had to decide to make that kind of sacrifice so the people could continue living in peace. Someone had to be brave enough to decide that the people they cared about were worth risking their life for. On the other hand, Don knew that just risking his life wouldn't be enough, and the experience that he'd just gone through that day had proven it. If Don went out and onto a battlefield in his condition, weak, slow, and unskilled, he was just going to get himself killed very quickly. The night captain had been right to warn Don about the danger, although he'd been surprised by the warrior's words at the time. he just seemed so supportive of Don's decision, which was sort of a shock by itself. When Don took a moment to think it over, though, he realized that most of the reason he found it shocking was because his father persistently went in the opposite direction, trying to drive him back away from the kind of lifestyle that he wanted. Don continued to think about those things as he drifted off to sleep that night, hungry but still determined. Respect for one's parents was a fundamental law of the true way, and yet he knew that if he stayed where he was and continued to obey his father, he'd never get any closer to obtaining the kind of life that he felt he needed. That was the moment when he truly decided that he was going to leave home.